We've seen the devastating impact of our COVID-19 on our community's health and welfare and on our food systems and within our own families. Food insecurity has risen dramatically in almost every county around the world. Just in the past year, the World Food Program estimates that more than 111 million people are without sufficient food, and food prices have soared by 20% in just the last year. Climate change has also shown the devastating and persistent impact of wildfires, droughts, flooding, and other natural disasters, all of which have had a major effect on our ability to grow the food we eat. And yet, we seem to be turning a corner from darkness and decline to progress and renewed prosperity. Vaccines to protect our populations have been developed in record speed and are being administered in record quantities. We are even beginning to see progress in the global distribution of vaccines. As patent and trait restrictions are waived, and international collaborative efforts are getting more and more shots in the arms of people on every corner of the world. Of course, we're not yet out of the woods. The road is likely to be both windy and long. But we can see the beginning of our new normal, a return to life as we've known it. These crises have also underscored the growing necessity of international collaboration and the importance of strong global institutions and determined international leadership. Later this year, the United Nations will hold a food system summit, which presents a unique opportunity for us to address the fundamental issues within our global food system. Our dialogue today is in direct support of the UN summit. We will highlight how agricultural innovation can play a critical role in supporting a more resilient, sustainable, and equitable food system. Today, we will amplify the need for innovation in our food systems by showcasing some amazing advances and game-changing ideas. Innovation depends on sound research and on investments from both the public and the private sectors. Private foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have made crucial investments in agricultural development and have made an incredible difference in reducing extreme poverty and in enhancing the nutrition around the globe. It's therefore my great honor to kick off this symposium with Mark Sussman, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mark began his career as a journalist for the Johannesburg Star and then with the Financial Times. In 2000, Mark joined the United Nations, where he was part of the effort to implement the Millennium Development Goals under the leadership of then Secretary General Kofi Annan. I had a chance to speak with Mark a few days ago. Listen to our conversation. Mark, uh, the pandemic has dramatically shown the fragility of the food system. Uh, along with the fragility of our health and, and, and other systems. Um, what role do you see uh, that technology and innovation and R&D can play in accelerating a breakthrough innovations and solutions to the food, si food system looking forward? Yeah, absolutely. On, on both the COVID impact and then the wider impact of other uh, challenges, particularly climate change, uh, have a devastating effect on overall food security, especially in rural areas in the poorest parts of the world in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we tend not to think of technology as a key solution there, but it is absolutely critical. And it's critical in a number of key areas uh, from research and development among more resilient crops, more resilient livestock, protection against diseases, uh, ways to look at soil, et cetera. So uh, there are a vast array of critical investments uh, which are often not understood, which both can address current needs and more importantly, uh, build much more resilient systems for the future. So the UN uh, Food System Summit later this year uh, could be and perhaps should be an inflection point for change in a really big way, uh, perhaps along some of the lines that you've just mentioned. Uh, of course, the aim is to launch a bold new action to transform the way the world produces and consumes food as part of the decade of action as we head to the SDGs uh, by, by uh, 2030. In, in your view, um, 
what commitments or solutions are needed now for bold transformation. Yeah, so the UN Food System Summit is a critical moment because we haven't really had a, a sort of forcing event that pulls together all major governments and other partners looking at the connected thing of food systems. That's around agricultural production, that's around nutrition-related activities. And in the current year, it also fits very much with the wider discussions about you know health and the COVID response and also the critical discussions around climate and particularly the upcoming uh, COP26 uh, meetings in, in Glasgow later this year. And so what we're certainly hoping for is that some of the core commitments, especially around what we call in the climate sense, climate adaptation, you know, significant investments in agricultural research is not seen as a first, uh, necessarily a first input, but we know that the CGIR, for example, the consultative uh, group on international agricultural research, which the United States has been a critical long-term supporter of, you know, needs really to double its funding. Uh, we're significant supporters, but we see some huge opportunities around, for example, more drought or flood resilient crops, uh, which they're already working on uh, for dealing with particular pests and other traits that are important for productivity. And that does a sort of as they have both and it, it both allows uh, you know real time accelerated in investments uh, down to the country level where the production actually matters for uh, the poorest people, but it also is putting in place uh, the framework that's going to allow us to have much stronger and more resilient food systems in the future. And so that would be a key critical set of investments that we really see as a top priority. But then ideally, those will be linked into a number of other key areas, for example, of large scale uh, food fortification linkages, which uh, have immediate health benefits for populations and are not yet widely utilized, uh, and a number of other similar steps. You know, if you, if you look at the challenges that uh, some of which you described, and, and if you look at what governments uh, are facing today, on the one hand, they're dealing with the immediate problem of both the pandemic and trying to deal with, with the health crisis as it exists and uh, the challenge of recovering their economies. And at the same time, they need to start thinking about dealing with the future challenges that you've laid out, climate, natural disasters, perhaps another health-related uh, uh, crisis that is just around the corner. And, and so how, how do you, what advice would you have for governments and how should governments think about dealing with both the immediacy of the crisis, but then to have a systemic approach uh, to uh, resolving uh, and dealing with the future challenges? Yeah, well, first is just acknowledging the systemic interlinkages. Uh, so in President Biden's recent uh, Global Climate Summit with world leaders that Bill Gates participated in, unfortunately, there was only a tiny fraction of comments, and one of them came from Bill, that really focused on adaptation as opposed to mitigation now, mitigation is critically important, but you need to look at these as two sides of the same coin and the adaptation for the poor smallholder farmers, because it is those parts of the world, again, in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where climate change is already happening, where you are having the biggest effects on agricultural productivity through uh, recurrent droughts and floods. That And these are people who contributed least to climate change. So I think there is uh, both an obligation and an opportunity to have a much bigger, stronger focus. And indeed, the Global Commission on Adaptation, which recently uh, reported, made a set of recommendations in that regard. So I think it is essential to integrate that into the wider climate discussion and make sure it's constantly there. And then linking it back into those, you know, it's, it's tough uh, to always... Um, if you like, advocate for research and development, because that often seems longer term. But as we've seen now with the dramatic investments that have had to come in belatedly into global health to address the COVID crisis and the robust discussion that's happening over future pandemic preparedness, we need to look at that as an equivalent set of expenses that are really investments in the food production and agricultural uh, system space because that both helps with wider economic growth and productivity for the poorer countries and it provides resources against very immediate needs for human beings uh, you know, who need income and food where, and are highly dependent on agricultural systems. So if, if we were joined here by uh, a head of state, what would you tell her to, to invest in right now as the first priority? 
Yes, yeah, so it's a it's multiple because it depends. Are you a head of state of a uh, a sort of wealthier country or uh, a lower middle income country? But certainly, all of them should be doing some degree of investments in the research and development. You know, the global research and development the aspects like CJR are mostly funded by developed countries and philanthropies like us because they, but these are global public goods for the world. But then there are also national agricultural research centers, which you know every country, even the poorest, have about how do you take this technology and actually move it into your food systems, you know, so, and having proper plans and investments. There are frameworks, for example, the Comprehensive uh, African Agricultural Development Framework, CADAP, which actually has a set of requirements for all African countries about how much they invest in agriculture and what they measure. But to be honest, only a few countries actually follow all those commitments. And they really, we need to have a, a stronger focus, some sets of accountabilities and support from entities like us, from the Food and Agricultural Organization, from others that help those countries uh, with the strong, robust agricultural plans they need. But it definitely is a both and. We need support from countries like the United States, both at the research and implementation level, and then we need the direct investment and prioritization by developing country leaders themselves. Mark Sussman from the, of Gaines Foundation, thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you. It was so great to hear from Mark Sussman. And now I'm pleased to introduce Claudia Sadoff, Executive Management Team Convener and Managing Director of Research Delivery and Impact at the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. Claudia will share why publicly funded agricultural R&D is pivotal in providing transformative innovations within the food systems. Thank you so much, Claudia, for joining us today. Good morning, and thank you, Ambassador Dalder and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for inviting me to participate in this Global Food Security Symposium at such a critical moment. When CGIR was founded 50 years ago, our mission was deceptively simple in its aim to end hunger. At the time, millions of people were in mortal danger for want of sufficient calories to meet their basic needs. But widespread famine was prevented thanks to groundbreaking agricultural research and innovation that accelerated food production and distribution. Fast forward five decades, and we have a much broader understanding of the contributors to and the consequences of hunger. With half a century of science behind us, CGIR recognizes that food insecurity is intertwined with the climate and environment, with poverty and inequality. We can see clearly how these challenges interface through the lens of food systems. These interconnected networks of actors, activities, and resources involved in the production and consumption of food link the fortunes of people and planet. Our scientists have demonstrated year after year that improvements in food systems can bring better health and nutrition, better prospects for development and education, and better livelihoods for rural families. From biofortified crops with enhanced levels of vitamins to maximize nutrition, to new ways to store and extend the life of staple crops, game-changing innovations in food systems can be life-changing for rural households. But food systems currently face a wide range of very serious challenges. A growing climate crisis and rapid environmental degradation, not least among them. CGIR's research and innovation therefore seek to support sustainable food systems that can meet the needs of expanding global populations without degrading and depleting natural resources. CGIR has also been at the forefront of developing climate smart technologies that support adaptation and mitigation in the face of an increasingly unpredictable climate. The positive impact of agricultural research is borne out by evidence. Recent analysis found that a dollar invested in CGIR has generated $10 in returns for low-income countries. With all the associated benefits for societies, economies, and ecosystems of more resilient and equitable food systems, public investment in agricultural research and development is essential. Yet the reality is that the growth of public investment in agricultural research has not kept pace with need. Real spending in agricultural research has fallen in many countries. In fact, a recent study confirmed that public spending on food security and nutrition must more than double from $12 billion a year to $26 billion a year. 
to keep the goal of ending hunger by 2030. This year then represents an enormous opportunity to reset our approach, not only to food security, but also sustainable development, climate change, species conservation, and income equality by putting agriculture and food systems research at the heart of public policy and investment. With the 2021 Food Systems Summit taking place later this year, the stage is set to correct our course and deliver the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. CGIR is rising to this challenge with an ambitious reform to become one CGIR, a truly integrated global organization positioned to develop the transformative innovations that our complex 21st century food systems need. Through agricultural innovation, we aim to help double incomes for smallholder families and unlock the equity effects of more inclusive food systems. To achieve this, we are calling for a doubling of investment in research and innovation by 2030. As the world recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic, agricultural research and innovation is more vital than ever. At this global inflection point, one CGR stands ready to support countries, partners, and beneficiaries worldwide with world-class science. Over the years, our mission may have evolved, but our commitment to research and innovation to develop the solutions that tackle our greatest global challenges remains resolute. I know so many of you with us today share this commitment, and I look forward to a fruitful conversation that will help us collectively identify ways to support the agricultural research that is needed to transform food systems in ways that will eliminate hunger, improve nutrition, increase incomes, promote equity, and address climate change. Thank you. That was great, Claudia, thanks. And now I'm so pleased to welcome Secretary Tom Vilsack, the 32nd U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. Secretary Vilsack has been a longtime supporter of the Council's global food and agricultural work, and he's been a frequent speaker at our symposiums. We're thrilled to welcome him back. Secretary Vilsack, thank you so much for joining us again today. Hello, it's certainly great to be back to the Chicago Council. I wish I was there in person. And maybe someday when we all get vaccinated, uh, I will be able to visit with you in person. But two weeks ago, the Biden-Harris administration convened 40 world leaders in a virtual leader summit on climate to rally the world in tackling climate crisis and meeting the demands of science. Uh, USDA supports the vision of a net zero economy by 2050. We believe agriculture, which is both severely affected by the climate crisis and a source of innovative potential solution to the climate crisis, is a great place to start. We face a complex challenge. How to sustainably feed a growing population while slowing and ultimately reversing greenhouse gas emissions and environmental degradation and building back better. To be effective, our approaches need to be innovative as innovative as our farmers, and as dynamic as the shifting context in which they operate. Sustainable agricultural productivity growth is a powerful engine for poverty alleviation, increased food security, and improved standards of living. Now we must invest in innovation to enhance existing approaches and deliver new ways to grow and use food and fiber, to increase our productivity and efficiency, to reduce waste, devise renewable materials and fuel, improve livelihoods, and build a far more resilient food system, all the while reducing greenhouse gas emissions and sequestering carbon. Now, to achieve our ambitious goals, the United States is investing in scientific breakthrough research. We also know that our current food system leaves too many of our farmers behind, as they are not able to make a living on farm income alone. Now, what we envision at USDA is a renewed food system in which food is recognized as one of the most important ways to promote health and to protect our bodies from disease, where a greater share of the food dollar goes to those who grow and raise our food, and where food production is recognized as a key means in building our economy, conserving and restoring our working lands, and ensuring robust ecosystem services. With this renewal, 
We recognize that rules-based, market-oriented international institutions are key to our global success. Well-functioning markets and trade are critical to food and nutrition security and to enhancing the sustainability of our food and agricultural systems. USDA supports the UN Food Systems Summit and the goals of improving the sustainability and resiliency of food systems around the world, as well as providing safe, nutritious, affordable, and accessible food for all. The U.S. government's global food security strategy, which expires at the end of the fiscal year, is currently being refreshed, providing an opportunity for USDA to elevate climate change into our national food security policy and associated developmental programming. To protect natural habitat, we're scaling up innovations that will allow us to produce more with fewer resources. President Biden is committed to conserving at least 30% of U.S. domestic lands and waters by 2030, working in partnership with state and local governments, tribes, civil society, farmers, and conservation groups. This effort will preserve ecosystem services and help arrest the loss of biodiversity and habitat. We know the cost of the ongoing climate crisis are incredibly high. The financial and human toll of forest fires, drought, and other extreme events in the U.S. has been astronomical. To advance all three dimensions of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental, we need to focus on innovation solutions that are inclusive and accessible globally, paying special attention to women, those who live in extreme poverty, small-scale producers, family farmers, youth, indigenous peoples, marginalized communities, and small and medium-sized enterprises. We must also increase job opportunities and develop skills for the modern food economy, equitable access to inputs in finance and market information. We can't afford to delay in addressing the climate impacts of and on our food systems and on food security. So I guess it's time to get to work and let's get to it. We're so grateful, Secretary Vilsack, for your leadership and for these remarks. Finally, we need to turn to our panel of innovators. They will discuss how rethinking food systems is a shared responsibility that requires bold cooperation, commitments, and action from the public and the private sectors. They will also highlight how game-changing innovations and high-impact solutions have the potential to radically transform the food system into a more sustainable, inclusive, nutritious, and resilient system. Louisa Burwood-Taylor, Head of Media and Research at AgFunder, will moderate this discussion. We thank Louisa and, of course, our panelists for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ivo. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for me. I'm over here in the UK. My name is Louisa Boa-Taylor, and I'm head of media and research at AgFunder. We're a venture capital firm focused on investing in food tech and ag tech uh, companies. And I'm also the chief editor of AFN, which is a news service dedicated to reporting on all the activity in this space. So welcome to the 2021 Global Food Security Symposium. And we have an exciting program for you today on game-changing solutions for transformational food systems. So thank you all for joining us via YouTube for today's On the Record program. Uh, if you would like to submit a question to today's panel, you can do so online at ccga.live. And I'll be monitoring those questions throughout the conversation. And we'll also have um, a Q&A portion at the end of this hour long session. So just a quick reminder, the Council is a non-profit, independent and non-partisan pl platform. So the views expressed by the indiv individuals today will be their own and not representing any institutional positions or views of the Council itself. So the Council is convening this discussion today ahead of the UN Food Systems pre-summit and summit in July and September, which some of the previous speakers spoke about, and I'm sure you're all really excited about. And today we really wanted to drill into the importance of game-changing solutions of technology in radically impacting and transforming global food systems. So we have a great lineup of speakers today on this panel I want to introduce you to. 
First up, we have Elliot Grant, who is General Manager of Mineral at X, the Moonshot Factory. Elliot, maybe you could give a little wave and so we can see who you are. Oops. Hi. He uh, was the founder and CEO of Harvest Mark, a pioneer in food traceability, and CEO of Shopwell, a personalized nutrition company. We also have Dan Harburg. Dan, you could give a wave too. Uh, Vice President and Global Head of Carbon Quantification at Indigo Agriculture. Uh, Dan also was an investor at Antera Capital, which was one of the first venture capital firms to focus on food tech and ag tech based out of the Netherlands. We have Rihanna Lin, founder of Journey Foods, a food tech company. Hi, Rihanna. Supporting cutting edge product management and data services for food businesses. And she has developed high growth, nationally recognized technology and food businesses in the past. And last but not least, Rebecca Moses. Uh, is head of impact strategy at Impossible Foods, a company addressing climate change and sustainable food futures um, through plant-based meat. And her work focuses on how product innovation and consumer behavior can maximize environmental outcomes through business growth. So great panel. Thank you all so much for joining us. So I'm going to start with uh, a fairly big, broad question for all of you. What are What do you think are the most pressing global food system challenges that we need to address in order to create a more sustainable and resilient food system. Perhaps, Elliot, you could start. Thank you, Louisa, and thanks to the Chicago Council. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this discussion alongside such terrific thought leaders. So as you mentioned, scaling regenerative or sometimes called sustainable and resilient agriculture is definitely one of the most pressing global food system challenges. And the climate crisis and population growth make this even more pressing. But I think as you implied in your question, this is a systems problem, meaning it involves many stakeholders and complex, sometimes competing interests. So while technology will play an important role and is a necessary ingredient, in my view, it's not alone sufficient. Plus, the paradox facing us is that the global food system, as we've heard um, from Secretary Vilsack and from uh, from Mark Sussman, must make a radical large-scale change in very short order. But, and this is the paradox, it's structurally and inherently hard to change agriculture. And typically we have to wait a year to see the results of any experiment, or maybe six months if you go North and Southern Hemisphere. Despite these challenges, I actually remain optimistic that there's a there is a way for innovation to cut this Gordian knot. And that's because technologies such as machine learning and computing capacity are improving at an exponential rate, making it pretty much impossible for us to predict their impact even a few years from now. But let's assume that there will be consumer demand for change and there will be commensurate political will for change. I'm actually very confident that machine learning and computing capacity will be able to solve these incredibly complex systems problems and transform the food system. Interestingly, machine learning is in many ways ideally suited for this problem, processing huge amounts of data and discovering patterns, predicting behaviors and recommending actions that would be frankly impossible for humans to do alone. So in some, I'm actually very optimistic that uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is a great fit for the challenge we're facing in agriculture. Great, thank you, Elliot. Uh, Rihanna. Could you tell us what you think are the most pressing global food system challenges today? Yes, Louisa, I could go on uh, for for hours on that, Um, but I I do want to uh, thank Chicago Council. Uh, uh, You know, Journey Foods launched out of Chicago. I'm a product of uh, many Chicago thought leaders in food, so thank you so much for for inviting. Uh, I want to echo a little bit of what Elliot said as well. Uh, At Journey Foods, we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to really dive into the middle part uh, of the supply chain and that's uh, manufacturing and and packaging and processing of of the foods that uh, feed all of us every single day. You know, most of us, uh, especially in the US, more than close to 70% of our daily caloric intake is, is packaged, processed, manufactured foods. Uh, that includes uh, items like Beyond, uh, like uh, Impossible Foods, and, and I have you know experience scaling products like Beyond Meat. And you know, uh, for, for me, I really think of the combination of uh, both nutrition and sustainability. Uh, in the past seventy years, especially as we've accelerated into a new sort of industrial revolution in, in 
and convenience foods. And we sort of returned from World War II and decided we did not want to farm too much anymore as a like family unit. Uh, we had the proliferation of, of grocery stores and, and the food science and, and convenience foods. And so that's within a uh, very, very widespread uh, detrimental effects, not only to our environment, but also to our, our bodies and our overall health uh, in every country across this world. And so we really need to think about how, of course, as, as many have said in introducing this panel, how we can not only scale for products that are gonna to have to continue to be processed and manufactured and packaged and uh, find some op opportunities within self-stability of food uh, to, to really press forward in, in, in the nutrition of the products we eat every day. You know, almost close to 80% of uh, chronic diseases caused by diet. You know, you could say that food systems and, and the, uh, in, in sort of the the, the possibilities and, and also the, mis, the sort of uh, scientific uh, scale and technology over the past 70 years has really missed out on opportunities uh, to have conversations like this. And, you know, unfortunately now we have to say that, you know, food is the number one cause of environmental degradation and nutritional degradation uh, across the world. Uh, and, and sort of, uh, we could also say that perhaps diet in the way that we do food today is uh, the number one cause of death across the world. And so uh, very excited to continue the conversation here, uh, but I most absolutely believe that having conversations like this and then also using data and machine learning is a, a way to accelerate or reverse a lot of this, this damage. Great, thank you so much, Rihanna. And actually I heard a statistic uh, recently, which is quite scary on the health front, it's that 85% uh, of US consumers are deemed metabolically unhealthy, which means they have uh, diabetes or other food related illnesses. Um, and there was actually, a com there was a correlation between complications from COVID and being metabolically unhealthy. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done there on that front. Um, Dan, can you share with us your most pressing global food system challenge? Sure, Louisa. Um, thank you to the council as well for the invitation to be a part of this today. It's a great, Great topic and a great group to be to be thinking about these critical issues with. And as we look out at the, the world, I think we see agriculture accounting for nearly a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions today. And as Mark deftly put in his introduction as well, with the continued change in climate, agriculture needs to adapt to the the, the world of of droughts and floods being you know more persistent. Um, so, you know, what, as you look at something uh, as big and important as agriculture, and you think about how much of our existing emissions it accounts for, you know, there's a negative tail spin there of more emissions are leading to more challenges in food and ag, which lead to yet more emissions. So clearly we need to get out of that, that loop. Now, uh, agriculture needs to transition from being a, a source of greenhouse gas emissions to a potential sink. So we need to figure out ways to reduce emissions and, and sequester carbon. Uh, in agricultural soils, which, you know, fortunately with millions of farmers around the globe actively making decisions every day about how to manage their farms, coupled with, you know, billions of acres of farmland around the globe, there's a real opportunity for us there to, um, you know, if we can get over some of the hurdles Elliot mentioned, right, changing practices is not straightforward. People have done things the way that they have always done them and, and um, you have a very limited set of experiments. You know, the statistic that I sometimes think about is an individual farmer may only have 30 chances to experiment. If you think about the 30 growing seasons that they have in their career before time's up for them and they pass the farm on to someone else in their family. So that's a very limited loop um, if, if that's the only set of experiments that they can run to think about. And it's super risky to make changes and uh, not knowing what is going to happen. So Clearly, uh, technology needs to be able to empower people to make smarter decisions about how they are managing their farmland. Um, and we need, to, we need to develop also new technologies to accelerate the drawdown of carbon into soils, you know, find ways to replace synthetic fertilizers with other alternatives that don't have the same consequences on runoff or nutrient leaching and um, greenhouse gas emissions. You know, we need to, to take advantage of cover cropping and no-till and some of the things we already know work to reduce emissions, but, but there's a whole host of new technologies that also need to be developed to 
accelerate that change and make this even easier for farmers. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great point you make about making it easier for farmers. You can have all the technological innovation in the world, but it could be something that's really tricky to adopt. It can be it's wasted farmers' time up until this point. You know, there's been some fatigue, um, so it definitely has to be a no-brainer for adoption. That's that's a great point. Uh, Rebecca, moving on to you um, and moving you know more downstream, closer to the consumer with consumer products. But you know, tell us what is the most pressing food system challenge. You know, I think the composition of this panel really highlights the array of challenges, but also the, the array of opportunities. So it's um, great to be able to con contribute our viewpoint to this. Um, I, I'm going to speak to livestock, and I think our most pressing challenge is that demand for meat and dairy is, is growing exponentially uh, globally. We do need a way to sustain and meet that demand uh, without tipping ecosystems past a point of no return. And, and we heard from Secretary Vilsack earlier about ecosystem services. The importance of maintaining those. Um, the two biggest things I'm thinking about in this in this uh, space are climate change and land use. Uh, so livestock does occupy about half of the planet's land area. Uh, most of that is grazing for, for cattle, for managed herds. Um, and over the next couple of decades, demand for meat and dairy is going to increase anywhere from about 60 to 80 percent. But those systems have no room to grow. Uh, so the, the scale of global animal farming already is a lead, leading driver of, of deforestation, uh, species extinction, and it's a major driver of climate change. Uh, we talk about agriculture being a big driver of climate change, but one seventh of, of total human caused greenhouse gas emissions do come from animal farming, animal agriculture, uh, particularly. So um, the thing that we don't talk about as much, and in, in addition to those emissions, is the fact that it's also effectively preventing us from storing enormous amounts of carbon in above ground biomass in trees and vegetation. Uh, and that's, you know, simply put, there would be a, a lot more trees, a lot more vegetation pulling carbon out of the atmosphere if we weren't taking up half of the planet farming cows. So we could store about 15 years worth of fossil fuel emissions, the equivalent greenhouse gas uh, uh, volume in landscapes that are currently producing uh, pastures and feed if we didn't need all those domesticated grazing animals. So all this seems very doom and gloom, but uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here. Technology and innovation, um, things like developing meat from plants using crops that we currently grow uh, are needed to provide consumers solutions to meet demand for these enormously popular food categories that we've all grown up loving. They're part of our culture. They're part of our food culture. Uh, we just need to find a way to do it without bankrupting the planet. So food tech is, is definitely well positioned to do that. And it's very well established by now that no matter how much we talk about wildlife loss, about climate change, about how bad this is all going to be for us later on, uh, you know, we as humans are, are simply not designed to change our behavior for an abstract concept. Um, so we shouldn't plan or bet that society is going to kind of voluntarily abstain from these products. We need a way to make it sustainably uh, using existing crops. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. A lot to unpack there. But I just want to um, sort of touch base with you all again and dig into um, you know, what your technological solutions are um, and exactly how they work and, and what they're working on. So, Elliot, can you tell us more about X? Sure. Happy to um, and excited to. So at, at X, uh, we try to imagine a future state and then work backwards to figure out what technological breakthroughs will be necessary. And that future state may be 10 or 20 years out what technology breakthroughs will be necessary, but in particular those that won't be achieved by incremental changes. So our project, which uh, you heard was called Mineral, started with the insight that in order to grow regeneratively and do it at a global scale, we're gonna have to invent new tools to manage the staggering complexity of farming under uncertainty. And we often talk about 10X thinking, meaning you can't take world tried and true methods and tools and just to try and to apply them harder and expect anything except incremental change. So if we want to achieve a 10x change, we have to think completely differently. So let me give you an example. We are anticipating that to bring climate resilient, locally relevant and adapted crops to market in time, we will require a new era of crop breeding technologies. And we heard Mark Sisman from the Gates Foundation mention this. And despite breathtaking advances in genomics, Breeders and the, the companies that develop crop protection uh, technology still rely on test plots and grower trials that are analyzed by experts walking through the fields 
using techniques that would have been familiar to Norman Borlaug five decades ago, meaning a yardstick and a, and a pencil and notepad. So the question we asked ourselves was, what would it take to scale a breeder's expertise by 10x? What would it take to scale these trials throughput by 10x? You heard us talk about a trial takes a year. You know, how can we accelerate that and do it more cheaply and make it relevant to developing countries? And then how can we develop far more complicated experiments such as intercropping uh, plants? So with that, those questions, one of the promising areas that we're exploring at X with our partners like uh, breeders and NGOs like the CGIR and universities is a robotic system for radically increasing the number of test plots that can be evaluated, radically increasing the level of detail that can be extracted from each plant and increasing the frequency that these plants can be measured. And this robotic technology makes extensive use of the latest artificial intelligence and machine learning that I referred to. And we think we're gonna, this technology will enable the uh, you know, growers of the future to perceive the plant world and help our partners analyze these breeding lines in completely new ways. And I think it's important just to also mention though, though we're very technologically, technologically focused, we put a huge emphasis on listening carefully to the breeders and the growers and the landowners uh, and suppliers and buyers, including those in lower income countries about the barriers that they face to, to sustaining and scaling uh, agriculture. Uh, because you know it's very simple to sort of build a technology that only is relevant for uh, an advanced nation, but as we've heard consistently so far on the panel, these solutions have to be applied globally. So that's something we're working on making a lot of progress and we're excited to update you more in the future. Sounds great. And we actually have a question from the audience, Elliot, that I'm going to put to you um, as it you know, slightly follows on. But it's asking, you know, why, why do we focus on improving food security by creating more resilient crops um, and by introducing new technologies and innovating? I think the concern is that a lot of the beneficiaries there are going to be large agribusinesses um, and that there's not enough focus on, on smaller farmers. Do you have a response to that question? Um, well, so I think it's an actually very well put question, and the, uh, the the questioner is correct that very many, very much of the world's food is produced by smallholder farmers. Right? It's easy to, to focus on like the Midwestern agriculture, but if you actually look at sheer volume and numbers, it's developing in majority world. It's smallholders, so the question is correct. Um, but yet, those smallholders are being dramatically impacted by climate change. They're also being impacted by uh, labor availability, surprisingly, right? So people don't want to work on the farm. The farm work is difficult. The chemicals they have access to are potentially toxic in some circumstances. So it's actually, I would argue, it's even more important that we develop solutions for these underserved markets. Um, now, what I'm not, but I'm, to be clear, I'm not saying that these farmers are not growing sustainably. Ironically, many of the regenerative practices that we talk about in the West are, are well known to indigenous populations, things like crop rotation. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a situation of both and. We need different solutions for um, developed countries to be more sustainable, and we need appropriate technologies for smallholder farmers who are being unfairly impacted by the shocks of climate change. So I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Rihanna. So you're a biologist and, and a serial entrepreneur and you've long focused on food tech and food innovation. How did you, you know, come to start Journey Foods? And can you tell us a bit about how you're using uh, technology and data? You know, absolutely. When I, when I think about my experience, both from entrepreneurial side as well as uh, on the investment side, uh, consulting side, you know, oftentimes what was happening is we were taking too much time and spending too much money bringing subpar products to the market. Uh, we spend $3 trillion uh, globally a year on, on packaged and processed manufactured foods. Um, and, and a lot of the major crops are, are with, a, with very little biodiversity, I would say. Uh, and, and so when I started Journey Foods and, and really brought the team together, the idea was to both look at food science, but also the supply chain so that uh, we can not just go on this like pie in the sky goal um, of like just making food healthier or, 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 you know, making it more affordable, but also thinking about the supply chain and the impact of, of our choices when it comes to manufacturing uh, you know, billions of units of food every single day. 
And so uh, at Journey Foods, we pair food scientists and, and data scientists and also just bring in like really ethical thinking, uh, you know, that helps us understand uh, essentially a, a framework in neural networks that walk us through a few steps. And so that is one, what is the product application? What is the ingredient? Uh, what are sort of the goals of the company uh, that we're working with? Uh, and how can we scan through, you know, millions of data points in, in, in just a few moments and, and understand what product application they're trying to achieve. And so for example, uh, you're trying to make a, a gluten-free low glycemic index chocolate chip cookie. Uh, you know, how can we then apply the nutrition parameters that you need? How do we then scan for sustainability parameters that need to be met? Uh, but most importantly, and what's all, always left out here is uh, a view into the supply chain. And so um, oftentimes R&D teams are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, dozens of team members uh, in, in many, many months, more than a year to reformulate or formulate a product. And then they end up missing out on understanding how the supply chain can impact you know, that final development of the product. And so uh, because uh, startups do not have the manpower to uh, you know, hire food scientists oftentimes, and they're sort of at the will of co-manufacturers because big companies are just big and there's lots of bureaucracy and you know, a food science team is not working with the finance team, it's not working with the procurement team. Uh, there's many opportunities that we look into. And so we integrate with some of the world's top supply chain solutions, SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, and many others so that we can scan through that data. We also look how, at how we can ethically bring um, more solutions to the forefront. And so that's you know, understanding how a uh, switch to a more uh, indigenous crop may not um, wipe out you know, <laughs> half, of, half of availability in Canada, for example. And so there's lots of uh, decision trees that we have to go through for our customers and that saves them a tremendous amount of time. Uh, but for us at Journey Foods, it's like, how can we feed and reformulate more millions of uh, food product lines for, for billions of eaters in a shorter period of time? And uh, we're, we're very excited by um, our growth and, and also partnership. I think uh, as Elliot and others alluded to here, it's not gonna take one company, it's not gonna take one plant-based product, it's not gonna take one policy. We really need to work together in an industry that has typically been uh, very uh, proprietary we focus and, and sort of IP driven. Uh, we need to collaborate as much as possible and think through more open sort of source and shared behavior. Think more like software communities and, and other industries that have developed rapidly such as uh, FinTech. I, but, I, but I honestly believe that with these approaches, uh, but a, a very ethical and collaborative approach that we can accelerate some of these changes over the next few years. Thanks. And I have a, a follow up question for you, Rihanna, um, related to COVID. So did you have some clients asking you to look into, you know, the impact that COVID had on on supply chains and, and how that would impact sort of their their own supply chains individually and make changes to adjust for that? Absolutely. We, I would say there were three big adjustments that came from uh, COVID. And that was one looking into ingredients that um, boosted more immunity. And so uh, some of those ingredients definitely were impacted uh, very early on about Q2 of last year, for sure. Um, you know, prices were a, a big factor when it came to adjusting to products that were in demand. Um, but another thing that happened is there was an unprecedented growth in uh, online ordering, e-commerce, grocery store shopping and, and delivery. And so, uh, there were almost reverse effects on some of the progress because of uh, the, the toxicity and sort of the environmental uh, downstream effect with packaging. And so we launched a, a internal packaging feature that's been rolling out more and more every month. And uh, packaging became a very huge part of, of thinking about the supply chain for our customers as well. Great. Thank you so much. Just a reminder to everyone, if they want to submit a question to our amazing panel, you can go to ccga.live and I'll try and work through all of them as we go. Uh, okay, Dan, 
tell us about Indigo Carbon and, and the work that you're doing um, around harnessing nature to help farmers sustainably feed the planet. Sure thing. Thanks. Thanks for the question and the opportunity. Um, so Indigo Carbon is uh, essentially a, a program that was launched two years ago to try to help tackle the, the climate crisis that we mentioned in the intros here. You know, farmers have a unique opportunity to be a solution to climate change, but they need help making transitions. And one of the one of the first ways we think that help uh, can be structured is in the form of economic incentives to encourage practice changes that are beneficial from a climate perspective. But there have been a lot of government programs and other programs that have paid growers to make practice changes, but we are really interested in paying for outcomes. So we wanna actually see the climate benefit. We wanna see carbon drawn down into soils and we wanna see greenhouse gases reduced. And so the way that our program is structured is growers are getting paid based on those tons of CO2 equivalents, but that it could include methane, it could include nitrous oxide, um, but CO2 equivalents that are being removed or, um, or sequestered as a result of practice changes. So making a change from what they were doing in the past to something new. Uh, and so, like I said, the program was launched two years ago. Uh, since that time, we've had uh, over 2 million acres that have committed to making practice changes. We're, we're operational in 21 states here in the U.S. in our first project and are just in the midst of, of our quantification efforts to uh, measure the impact of the practice changes that have occurred in the last year. And, and we'll be selling credits uh, at a price of, of $20 uh, per ton of CO2 equivalent. Um, we've already had a number of large corporations, too, who have signed up to say, you know, this meets our goals for how we think about offsetting our carbon emissions. So those include groups like Boston Consulting Group and North Face and Shopify and Maple Leaf Foods, um, Dogfish Brewing, a number of other uh, financial institutions, technology companies and, and the like, uh, who, again, see nature-based solutions and specifically uh, high quality registry certified credits in the agriculture space as being a critical part of the solution. So that's that's where we are in, in the program right now. Uh, you know, we are building essentially the end-to-end -end system that works directly with farmers to help provide advice, aggregate those farms together, quantify their emissions, submit projects to uh, carbon registries who create high quality certified assets that then can be sold to, to offset purchasers. And so we manage essentially every one of those pieces trying to make this as easy as possible for farmers to participate uh, while again providing a, a high quality credit to purchasers. Um, how so I think you know uh, Secretary Vilsack mentioned this and we know that governments around the world there's been you know some noise over here in the Europe as well governments around the world are thinking about how they can regulate this or, or get involved uh, you know it's often the way that the private sector is a little bit of ahead of the curve on this you know what would be helpful for the US government in, in your case what would be helpful for them to be doing on this front in terms of some sort of regulation yeah, it's a great question, and it's a it's a complicated uh, complicated connection too to think about. You know, as the private markets and voluntary markets for carbon are really just in their infancy right now, I think there is a really uh, important balance that needs to be struck between how governments get involved uh, to both support these voluntary markets because we have again we have buyers who are willing to pay uh, for voluntary credits today that are not being mandated by the government. We're setting up these registry standards right now here in the US and around the globe. I think it's really important that we standardize on those standards, right? You know, what we don't want to see right now is the government coming in, building a whole new set of programs and building a whole new set of standards that disregard these already international standard bodies that exist. Uh, and, you know, to see individual countries look to create their own standards, I think would be really uh, distracting for um, for the market right now. So our our hope is that there is essentially support of some of the private markets and initiatives that are underway. You know, there could be funding for uh, more practice changes or pre-funding for farmers to get involved in those, but essentially adopting the standards that are already being established by these international bodies, again, I think is a really important part of how the government uh, can, should get involved in this. Can I, can I jump in there really quickly? Oh, um, please. I, I really, I'm really happy you asked that question. If you look at sort of how the U.S. impacted growth and innovation, and in, in, you know, in the in the past century, uh, we used to lead the world. Uh, they care in in 
and spend on R and D, and you know that number has been quite depleted when we think of our of the percentage of our GDP. And so I think you've seen across the world that nations are really growing and have impact when they invest in ideas and in practice changes. And so we definitely need, uh, as as Dan said, to find ways to fund. Um, the the support and the training of not only our most marginalized and smallholder farmers, but also the ideas and the innovations behind this in similar ways that you saw funding go, you know, to Silicon Valley and other uh, great innovations uh, between the 1940s and 1970s. And, and we see what, how that changed the world. Thanks for your input, Rihanna. Uh, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So we're about to move on to Rebecca. Uh, one of the questions is, in North America, raising cattle in feedlots contributes significantly to greenhouse gas emissions. Shouldn't we be cutting beef out of our diet? <laughs> I'm sure we know that your response is going to be yes. But there's also you know, some questions around um, how developing nations can um, can you know, get involved in this sort of innovation as well, well across, the, across the spectrum. But what I wanted to ask you, Rebecca, you know, was you know, you're making meat products from plants and you've had huge expansion in recent months to thousands of grocery stores. I think I, you know, I read somewhere it was like hundreds um, of times of growth between last year and this year, as you know, consumers increasingly are opting for meat alternatives. But can you tell us um, you know, the work you're doing in other parts of the world where maybe it's less of a consumer trend and how that's gonna fit overall into your impact and environmental strategy? Certainly, and, and there's, there's quite a lot to unpack on this front, so, so bear with me. Um, you know, I joined the company before we actually uh, had gone to market and we launched our product Impossible Burger with one restaurant in New York. And so it's, um, you know, we've made enormous progress. We're in tens of thousands of grocery stores uh, and, and, and restaurants across the US, uh, in Canada, Macau, Hong Kong, uh, and Singapore, but we still have this very small slice of the, of the total livestock market. Um, which is an enormous market. It's about $1.2 trillion globally. So while our economies of scale are certainly superior to animal rearing, we require far less inputs to make the same thing. Uh, part of the reason we can be much more sustainable. Um, there's a very big mission ahead of us. So I want to preface this also by saying the product itself is designed for engaging consumers in climate action. Uh, this is a way that even if you don't know necessarily about the impact that your food choice has on the planet, you don't have to. We recapitulate the experience of meat completely. So it's very versatile. It slots right into the food culture uh, that everyone is, is kind of familiar with. But for each pound of Impossible Burger, uh, you're reducing your footprint by about 90 gallons of water, uh, by about 300 square feet of land, and by about 30 pounds of carbon equivalents. And so it is this very scalable uh, way to make progress against the goals of the uh, Paris, uh, Paris Agreement, both from that emissions perspective, but also from this uh, idea of land sparing in addition to the, the yes and approach of um, you know, land sharing and how we uh, engage, uh, engage farmers within our agricultural, uh, sorry, engage farmers for sustainability. Now, globally, our international expansion strategy is going to be very aligned to maximizing the environmental benefits uh, of business growth. And so we're focusing quite a bit on Asia. Um, Asia, first off, is a hugely diverse region with incredible culinary scenes, uh, but it's also uh, a global bellwether on food trends. So it's a great place to launch in terms of commercialization, but it's also 44% of the world's meat consumption. And that has that, that region has far and away the, the fastest growth in demand for meat and dairy. So if we want to wed business growth with progress against climate goals, that's a really important place for us to be. Um, China alone has about 2x the demand for meat that the US population does. Um, we're moving as fast as we can to bring more of our product to market, especially in those high impact regions like North America and Asia where meat consumption is very, very high already and it's growing. Uh, but we are not the only actors here. And so you mentioned kind of, uh, you know, how is this sector manifesting globally and across the developing world? You know, we're not the only movers. And there's already amazing startups everywhere from Singapore to uh, Lagos, Nigeria, um, that are recreating the experience of meat using plants. Uh, one example is um, Omni Pork, which is, is uh, I believe, based out of China. There's also um, Veggie Victory, which is based out of Lagos. Uh, there are entrepreneurs, there are startups who are working on this um, quite aggressively as well. And so Impossible Foods, you know, wants to be everywhere and we will be everywhere. This is an all hands on deck issue. Um, 
there are so many ways that this sector can grow. And we're actually, uh, you know, because this is a uh, an ag conference and and um, the consulta consultative uh, research groups are involved, we're currently in the midst of a, a modeling exercise to look at the climate and land use outcomes of different growth scenarios globally. With different, with uh, we're working with research partners uh, at EASA and at CCAS. So this is an exercise that's very pre-competitive, and we're basically asking, you know, how many different agricultural crops that currently exist can be adopted into uh, meat from plants recipes into our supply chains across the world and which recipes are going to drive the biggest climate change uh, progress and drive the biggest opportunity for land sparing uh, in the most effective way. So uh, how can that in turn economically benefit areas that do not currently have a large plant-based meat industry and probably don't receive anywhere near the level of you know, financial investment that Silicon Valley has been benefited from and that Impossible Foods has benefited from. So we're going to release the results of that hopefully sometime uh, before COP26. But the upshot of all of this is, is just to kind of remember these plant-based transitions are sort of an, an unsung negative emissions technology uh, that we're gonna need to meet those goals of the Paris Agreement. And it's a, a very wide, uh, it's a very large market opportunity there as well. Thank you so much for that, um, Rebecca. So, look, you know, trying to combine a few of the questions I wanted to ask with with what some of the people watching are asking us. You know, I'd love to hear a bit about the challenges that you've faced in the innovation cycle. Uh, perhaps it's been challenges around adoption. You know, that's certainly been something that's been big on the farm tech side. Or maybe it's been a, a challenge around intellectual property. But you know, we're also getting questions around um, the best way for underrepresented founders to that lack network and access to resources. Uh, you know, how, you know, how can you get around some of those challenges too? Um, so, would anyone like to jump in on this question first? Do I need to pinpoint someone? I'll, I'll take a crack at it first, and I'm sure other people will jump in. Um, so I alluded to this and Dan mentioned it too. One of the challenges in doing experimentation and innovation in agriculture is you have to wait a long time to see the results. You know, And so to my knowledge, no one has made a field of soybeans grow from seed to maturity in a single day. And, and that's sort of I'm being a little facetious, but the, you know, compare that to a Silicon Valley company where I can release a new version of an app every day and see how a customer responds. Whereas in ag, I have to wait a whole season to see um, see the impact of of my innovation. So, you know, what can we do? And there are things afoot uh, that, are, you know, things like modeling, plant growth, and simulation that can give us some acceleration there. Also, you know, and I think the challenge that is often cited, but I want to sort of address it, I think, is a fallacy, is that farmers are actually reluctant to try new technologies. I think that's a myth. Um, it's certainly not been my experience, and I think as Secretary Vilsack mentioned, agriculture has really been the crucible of innovation and growers are inveterate tinkerers. Uh, you know, what I, my experience has been if farmers, if something works, then farmers will adopt it, uh, whether that's in, in the northern sort of hemisphere or in developing countries. If something works, farmers are very quick to adopt it. The trouble has been a lot of the technology that's been coming to market doesn't work. Um, and, you know, again, in Silicon Valley, this is quite normal, right? We throw things out there and see if it works. But it's, uh, and I think Dan mentioned this, it's very risky for a farmer to try something at scale if they're going to risk uh, their livelihoods. So I think that the, outshot, the upshot of that for us is it's important that technologists stay humble about what the technology is actually capable of. And I think I saw one of the questions in the, in the chat too, is also be better at listening than telling. Right, really, a lot of the answers are already out there in the community. And what if you listen closely enough, those farmers will tell you what they need. A, a short vignette, I had a conversation last week with a Kenyan farmer uh, who was practicing regenerative agriculture. And he said the problem was access to knowledge, access to seed, access to renting tractors near him. These were not super difficult technology problems. It was a question of um, logistics and efficiency for him. And he was actually very optimistic of the penetration of smartphones in the country and the increase in bandwidth, I think opens up an amazing opportunity to bring technology to these, um, to these users that will be transformative. So again, in some, I think you know, the challenge has been, it takes a long time to do experiments uh, and we need to be very practical and, and frankly, very honest with our partners of what's an experiment and what is actually gonna work. Brianna, yeah, I think you wanted to jump in. 
jump in there. So, you know, one thing that's very interesting is, you know, I, I truly believe that the innovation on the farm level is, 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 is you know, in a place and, and, and there's a lot of visionaries uh, that are doing great work in, in like vertical farming and uh, increasing crop yields. And then you have consumers uh, across the world that are really demanding things like plant-based meats and dairy. Uh, but in the middle of, of this sort of value chain, uh, what you're gonna see and what's happening is that co-manufacturers, manufacturing uh, is not really at a place uh, that we need uh, to develop and meet some of the consumer demand for, for these alternatives that are much better for the environment. Uh, so there are great opportunities here to, to sort of step up to these challenges, especially in North America, especially in places like West Africa, where we can, where we can really invest more in smart manufacturing and facilities uh, that can keep up with this demand and turn these better crop yields into newer innovations, into, you know, the impossible foods of, of, of West Africa and, you know, having manufacturing across rural North America. And, and so I really think that for the unsexy part of the, of the supply chain, which is so critically important, uh, needs to be a part of this because we are seeing, especially even founders that are developing plant-based uh, food companies, uh, have a bottleneck of getting their products manufactured in, in quality time. And, and so I think part of this is how we, how we invest and, and work together across uh, innovation and automation and, and using machine learning AI as well at the, at the manufacturing level and how we uh, sort of reinvigorate, uh, especially uh, North American and West African uh, manufacturing and, and development. Did anyone else want to jump in on the question around challenges, Dan? Yeah. One one reflection on challenges uh, that, that we've been thinking quite a bit about is, you know, it's the fact that agriculture accounts for a significant amount of greenhouse gases is, is certainly not missed by, by anyone. And the, the large food companies have started to do quite a bit of accounting of their supply chain emissions to try to understand what do we have, what are we dealing with today and how can we begin to transition some of our farms to more sustainable practices. But what that's resulted in for a lot of farmers is just a massive amount of paperwork and kind of increases to their cost of doing business with no real benefits to them. Um, you know, and so we, we've, we've seen forms upon forms of, you know, information that growers are having to fill out in order to just participate in these accounting frameworks for, for large companies. And so I think there's, there's a really critical challenge right now around data collection. Um, how, how can we gather the data that we need from farms to both quantify what they're doing today and help to use that to inform recommendations for changes uh, and, you know, and, and quantify the benefits of, of what they're doing. And so this is one of the places where uh, I think we, we, we're now able to take advantage of things like satellite imagery in a way that we haven't been able to um, do data integrations and data coming off of farm equipment and uh, integrating that with government data and essentially, you know, large exercises that many, uh, many of which I think are pretty competitive because they're, uh, you know, we're, we're connecting data sets that so far have lived in very separate silos, but that can be used by many people throughout the supply chain. Um, and so, I th you know, data collection, aggregation, cleaning, uh, and reporting, I think are really kind of nuts and bolts problems that support so much in the food supply chain, but that we can really, if we can help overcome those for farmers, then I think farmers stand to benefit considerably from all these programs, get better advice and do so without an, an increased burden on their time. Absolutely. And it's been a really interesting evolution, actually, of farm tech. You know, when I started focusing on this space about eight years ago, you had a lot of um, solutions. It was like a soil sensor and that soil sensor, they were going to do it alone and they were going to provide enough data for a farmer to revolutionize how he does things. And fast forward to today and that soil sensor is just one piece of the puzzle, right? And we've noticed, you know, a lot more collaboration. You've got the soil sensor startup company has now expanded its remit or it's partnered with other companies in remote sensing and so on. So this kind of idea of collaboration and partnerships has definitely been a trend that we've seen, particularly upstream in the last few uh, years. 
And we have a question from someone in the audience talking about how can we facilitate a better integration of disruptive industries to transform our food systems. And they've got a, a cool idea of, you know, producing plant-based protein using indoor farming techniques. So maybe you can, you know, speak a bit to collaboration and, and where you've got to on this. I know there's tends to be often in venture capital world, you want to kind of own it all and do it all yourself. But, you know, this is a complicated industry. So I think collaboration seems to be key. Who wants to jump in there? I think, yeah, I can start with that. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I think there's almost a, a level of informal collaboration that's happening in a competitive way right now. Uh, if you look at the landscape of, of things that are being commercialized, whether it's Oatly, which is addressing uh, various dairy products, including uh, milk, including ice cream, including yogurt, impossible foods, uh, our company, which is uh, commercialized already, uh, a ground beef alternative, a ground pork, uh, ground sausage alternative with more in the pipeline, uh, just, which is producing uh, eggs, there's a lot of coverage of the landscape already, even without kind of those direct forms of collaboration, uh, which I think is very important because of the urgency of this issue. We do need consumer alternatives to kind of every one of these categories, but especially uh, cattle products. And so I think, you know, there's uh, hypothetically quite a bit of room for collaboration, um, you know, in kind of the, the next iterations of research and development, um, especially for things like whole cuts, uh, those are a technological step above uh, ground meats in terms of the, the difficulty of bringing them to market and producing those at scale. So um, the other thing that we talk about internally and that I cannot speak to as I'm not our, our uh, IP lead, but our CEO has mentioned, you know, what are opportunities for Heme, uh, the, the intellectual property that we have? Is that something that could be licensed and support growth elsewhere? Um, <clears throat> and so there's, there's kind of endless opportunities for collaboration. I'm very interested to see where the sector takes that. Uh, but in the meantime, it seems like we're doing a pretty good job of getting coverage, at least uh, across the landscape, even without those direct engagements. Elliot, do you have a, a comment on, you know, this this farm tech and ag tech and food tech needing to collaborate more, maybe compared to, to other industries? You've been in Silicon Valley for a while. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's sort of the perennial question, I think. You know, historically, the ag industry has formed into these silos. You know, there are, there are equipment companies and input companies and farmers and then ad advisors. And these silos tend to have tended to sort of protect uh, and build businesses around protecting information and stopping it flowing up and down. And it's been a very successful business model. But now we look at the world where this interaction and interoperability is far more important. And we've heard, I mean, some of the examples in the panel today, the ability of a consumer to understand where was this yellow pea grown that went into my plant-based protein. So these questions are much more enabled by cross supply chain data transfer. And that's a new, that's still a new idea in the ag industry. And we're seeing this transformation of this siloed approach to more of a horizontal approach. I'm, I'm actually very optimistic. I think the technology is there um, to make this happen. Lots of questions still to answer around IP protection and privacy. Um, but the, there's a, there's a lot of movement right now around trying to identify interoperability standards so that these systems can talk to each other. We sometimes joke that, you know, you can open a, uh, a Word document on a Mac today, but you can't open you know, a file from Tractor Variety A on um, data platform B. So we, we, things that have become so normal in our everyday lives are still very difficult in the agricultural space. But I think that now that the incentives are starting to align, we'll see that transformation. Um, so again, I'm optimistic. I think data interoperability, data standards, and most importantly, protection of privacy will be solved. And I, I just want to double down on that point about privacy. You know, farmer data is an inco incredible important part of their business. This is often how a farmer makes the difference between making a profit and not making a profit is their practices. So whatever we do, we have to figure out how to protect the, the primacy of that individual's data. Right. Oh, Rihanna, did you want to jump in? I, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, one of our big challenges, but one of the biggest opportunities is exactly that interoperability of, of, of the systems of scoring of uh, data sets. Um, but again, uh, we all have to eat three times plus per day. Um, there's a lot of livelihood at stake. Uh, and so on the B2B realm, 
uh, we have to sort of think beyond our ego and, and into the broader solution and, and what's at stake here. And, but I, I absolutely agree with you, Elliot, that uh, there is so much opportunity, uh, in, especially in the B2B landscape of partnership and data integrations uh, that we really need to push forward. And, and I look at industries uh, like FinTech that have had recent breakthroughs, uh, but we most definitely have to keep uh, privacy at, at the forefront. Uh, we have lots of questions and just about 10 minutes left. So I think we should start to go through those. Sorry, Dan, if, if you wanted to add in something in there. Um, but the top question, and we've slightly touched on this, but how do we equitably transfer food system technologies? Um, you know, and someone added on a comment, especially to smallholder farmers in the global south um, who carry the food system, but it's cost prohibitive for them to access information and technology services. Who could jump in there? Happy to, to offer some perspective on it. I mean, we're, we see a huge opportunity uh, for smallholder farmers around the world to participate in carbon programs but it's a totally different data collection challenge, information sharing challenge um, and practice change challenge. Uh, you know, right now, if, if you think about a, a company like ours that has to go and work with the farmer to source data and do integrations and you know, be able to make quantification and so on, we're doing that across hundreds or maybe thousands of acres for a farm. And you think about doing all that cost for a single acre or a couple acres, uh, you know, that's that's pretty different in terms of what the business model needs to look like to make that uh, scalable for, for an organization. Uh, but at the same time, you know, as I think Elliot mentioned at the, the beginning, right, that this, these are the majority of acres and the majority of farmers around the globe. And whether you look at uh, animal uh, herd managers or crop farmers uh, around the globe, I and mean, one of our areas of interest, for example, is, is rice. Uh, rice is a huge uh, source of of carbon emissions in the form of, of methane uh, from the flooding of rice that happens uh, in most uh, lowland parts of the world. And we need to figure out better ways to manage water. And we need to be able to share information with these farmers and then be able to quantify the impacts and, and show a financial incentive for making a, a change. Um, and that will also help support preventing you know, more land from being degraded to, to be turned into farmland. So we see this as a, a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity. It just requires a whole new set of tools, different kinds of relationships, um, different different applications and ways of interfacing to the farmer than what we use in the West. But we're really excited to, to, to dig into it because we again, we see it as a, a huge opportunity, both for us as, for, as well as for the planet. Yeah, and as a follow-up, I mean, there's, there's also questions around the importance of local knowledge, um, and ensuring that you know local people are involved in in um, in innovation. So, like tr how you translate traditional knowledge into innovation. Rebecca, did you have a did you have a follow up there? Uh, just a, kind of an adjacent point, which is um, in terms of plant based meat production, something that we can be thoughtful about is uh, diversifying the crop basis of the ingredients that we use. So while right now impossible food sources commodity crops, right? We use soy, we use coconut oil, we use sunflower oil, uh, potato protein. It doesn't have to be that recipe. Uh, there are kind of an infinite number of crops that could technically work or be uh, incorporated into these supply chains for plant-based meat manufacturing. And we're going through an effort right now, again, with, with CCAPS and with the ASA and this modeling exercise to look at, well, what is the total opportunity space to diversify the types of crops we're using? And can that be specifically and strategically um, engaging smallholder and, and kind of mid-sized producers across the world in a different geographies than we currently source from. And that is very much a sector approach. That's not just impossible foods. That's something that we can be thinking about in terms of plant-based alternatives. Soy is wonderful, it's nutritious, it's, it's very sustainable. Uh, most soy production goes to livestock now, but there's no reason that we can't use a whole array um, of inputs uh, in a much more kind of diversified ingredient portfolio. Um, if I may also have another point on that question about equitable transfer, um, you know, something I'm actually optimistic about is the cost of accessing some of this technology. I think a mobile phone with limited bandwidth has dropped dramatically and is continuing to drop incredibly quickly. And I've been very encouraged. In fact, I've been amazed when I talk to farmers in 
in, in Kenya, for example, this conversation I had last week, how many times this farmer said, I go to YouTube and I search on something and I can find information. You know, now I think, you know, we've all been in lockdown for a year. We're familiar with using the internet to find educational resources. That's also true of farmers. So, uh, and right now it's happening, you know, I use the word you know, carefully, organically. Um, farmers are just searching information. They're putting information on the web. I think that will become more structured, meaning that there'll be incentives to make information available, share knowledge, and we're going to, I think, have the potential to break the the connection between location and knowledge. Historically, a farmer in a remote location would only be able to access knowledge from their local agent or the local retailer or a university extension. Now they have the potential to access the best knowledge in the world from their mobile phone in their native language. So I'm, I mean, yes, there's a lot of inequity in technology development, but I actually think that technologies like uh, mobile devices, bandwidth, and tools like YouTube will make it a lot more accessible. And, and just quickly, I want to add there, um, with equity, we need to think about um, also ownership and decision making. And uh, there's a few companies, global companies across the world that do this well. Uh, and they make sure that the farmers are, are on the board and are part of the ownership of the supply chain. And while we increase and, and have more solutions that uh, offer up uh, transparency and traceability, uh, such as the acquisition and, and, and sort of growth of, of things like blockchain, we need to figure out ways to make sure that uh, ownership and inclusion on decision making is, is, uh, top, is utmost important as well when we think about achieving equity in, in the system. Absolutely. And I'll just add on to um, both your comments that, you know, there are companies out there that are also creating technologies that are very much more accessible. There's a company called WeFarm that does everything via SMS. So, you know, you don't even need to own a smartphone to do that. And you can share phones in local communities to get information um, and get answers to your questions. So um, that is pretty cool. OK, let's see. We've got a couple more minutes for some more questions. A few people are asking about aquatic foods in the food system, um, such as microalgae, and why that couldn't be uh, a sustainable food source. I don't know if anyone has some questions, some uh, thoughts on aquatic foods. Maybe not the right panel for that one. Maybe I'll move on. Um, so how would you, this is quite a big question, but it's an important one. You know, how would you advise developing nations who have a restricted budget and are unable to decide whether to spend money on actual hunger solution campaigns or to make um, to spend more money on R and D. And someone gave you know a very uh, specific example, and they said that you know every continent has peculiar food security challenges. Nigeria, as a case for Africa, is characterized with weak political will to transform agriculture. Yet most donor funding efforts and investments are still channeled through governments. And so that can often be a reason that so um, much progress is not much progress has been made in solving food security. So how can global networks like this, um, you know, how can we assist the African continent differently? I'll, I'll take a, a crack at this. I'm, I'm not going to talk about you know, policy or advocacy, but rather a slightly different spin on the question, which is, I think there's an opportunity to expand the technical expertise in government. I think the more informed that government decision makers can be about what technology is available in improving their own technological capabilities, they can make more informed decisions for their citizenry. Um, and something I've experienced, not, um, not only in the rest of the world, but even in the United States, the public sector tends to lag uh, in its adoption of these technologies. And I think that has a knock-on effect of their ability to make decisions based on what's going to be what's possible five or 10 years from now. So I know I'm sort of dodging the question a little bit, but I think you know part of the answer is uh, better informed decision makers. Yeah, and, and just the, the will to learn, of course, I think that's, you know, a great approach in looking at best practices across the world and, and trying to infuse that into to your local policies. And, you know, I would just say here, um, when I think about how we develop Africa, I always refer to um, one of my favorite readings, uh, Walter Rodney's, I believe, 1971 book on how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Uh, it's the 50 year anniversary. I urge a lot of viewers here to go read that. And, and you know, alongside education and sort of uh, infusing best practices in, into policy, we need to make sure 
that we're giving Africa uh, in, and we're partnering and we're funding and we're you know, maybe immigrating to the continent to, to build the future of uh, infrastructure uh, when it comes to not only learning, but also uh, development and making sure that, you know, the continent with the most resource uh, rich continent in the world can develop um, products and processes uh, right there. Great, thank you so much. Well, that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much to the really insightful panel. I'd encourage everyone watching to follow them, find them on LinkedIn or social media and, and keep up to date with their companies because it's really transformational stuff. Uh, so I'm now excited to introduce Be Peggy Yi, the Managing Director for the Center of Global Food and Agriculture at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you so much, Louisa, for moderating an outstanding panel discussion. And thank you to our panelists for sharing your insights on your efforts that are contributing to game-changing solutions for our food systems. The food and agricultural system is an incredibly complex system rife with enormous problems and competing interests. As our panel mentioned, we face challenges such as food insecurity, diet-induced chronic diseases, the degradation of our environment and natural resources, and the loss of diverse biodiversity. As Rihanna succinctly said, we should be investing in ideas to change the world. Elliot Grant and Rihanna Lynn mentioned their use of machine learning and how it is effectively being used to accelerate changes across the food supply chain, from agricultural production to food processing. Dan Harburg noted the role of technology to empower farmers to more effectively steward their lands so that agriculture can transition from being seen as a carbon emitter to carbon sinks. He also mentioned how there should be a delicate balance of private markets and government intervention for carbon markets. Rebecca Moses discussed how plant-based proteins can offset the environmental footprint of livestock and dairy production. And there is a yes and approach for environmental and economic sustainability globally. Agriculture is the crucible of innovation, but innovation is not without challenges. There are challenges in scaling the technologies so that they can be applied to both large producers and to smallholder farmers. And there is a need to develop different right-sized solutions to equitably serve the underserved markets. There are challenges in interoperability, data collection, data aggregation, and data reporting and privacy across the food chain. There will also need to be a lens of ethical thinking applied to decisions and how final products are developed. We need to be better at listening than telling, as farmers will tell you what they need. In other words, to address our complex challenges, we will also need to invest in how we collaborate and work together across silos in the pre-competitive space to create new tools and new solutions. We also heard Mr. Sesman discuss the importance of public and private investments in food and agricultural R&D for understanding our complex and interconnected systems and for creating opportunities for fundamental changes to occur not only here in the United States, but all around the world in addressing issues such as climate, hunger, nutrition, poverty, and equity. Not only is it important, but it is a smart investment. As Dr. Sadoff noted that every dollar of investment results in $10 in return. Secretary Vilsack reminded us how food is one of the most important ways to improve our health and how innovations in food and agriculture are critical not only for conserving our natural resources and protecting our environment, but providing necessary tools and fair incomes for our farmers. I hope today's conversations have shown how exciting the future of food and agriculture can be with cutting edge innovations and how together we can address some of the most daunting challenges in society. I wanna take, take the time to thank our various partners. In particular, I'd like to thank the UN Food System Summit and the World Food Prize Foundation. Today's symposium would not be possible without the amazing efforts of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs fantastic staff. Thank you. Last but not least, thank you, our audience, for joining us today. We are grateful that you have taken the time out of your busy schedules to listen in on conversations about game-changing innovations that have the potential to radically transform our food systems. For more than a decade, the Chicago Council has advocated for U.S. leadership in global food and nutrition security and has convened experts and leaders to ensure the incredible, com incredible community of optimists and pragmatists that work on the wicked problems of extreme poverty and malnutrition do not lose momentum or support. At the Center on Global Food and Agriculture, we will build on that outstanding work to advance a more sustainable and resilient global food system 
by addressing challenges facing our planet and the most vulnerable producers and consumers. We hope you will join us in our work for the next decade and beyond. And on behalf of all of our speakers and panelists, thank you again. See you next time.